this has been a very interesting week for me. So along the course of this program, we have learned a lot about gauge theory in three dimensions and also in four dimensions. And we also learned about their interesting properties and the very rich invariants that we can define using them, such as the Donaldson invariants, cyber weight invariants, and the waffle weight invariants. But this lecture and the next won't be about gauge theories. Instead, we'll be talking about non-gauge theories. So what's wrong with gauge theories? Well, what's the motivation to go beyond gauge theories? In my mind, gauge theories are great. They are stepping stones to understand more general quantum field theories. But there are two minor shortcomings of gauge theories. First of all, we expect that from gauge theory, you are not going to be able to get stronger invariants of four manifolds than the cyber witten invariants. Indeed, if you study gauge theories as of higher rank or with more matter, somehow it seems that you can always relate these new invariants to the usual cyber with invariants. And another shortcoming is not about um, how powerful they are, but about the structure of these invariants. It's also not expected that gauge theory will give you full TQFTs. So one manifestation of this is that um, for those environments coming from gauge theory, sometimes it's not defined. on some manifolds. In other words, although sometimes you can still consider interesting cobordisms, you are not, it's, you, you shouldn't expect that you can package all these environments together into a nice uh, TQFT. Yeah, for, for example, for some with invariants, you would put conditions on B2 plus. And if it's uh, equal to one, then we know that you need to talk about this invariant in a particular chamber. And then if you want to study cobordism, it will be a nightmare. And Well, sometimes you need a metric, and that's uh, not the actual structure we want to use, right? We want to have some topological quantum field theory. And will gauge theory help with these two minor problems? From Pavel's talk, and perhaps uh, also his talk um, tomorrow, he will demonstrate how to use non-gauge theories in six dimension to uh, attack problem one. So today we have already seen that this invariant, even from the simplest sig theory, has a very rich structure. For today, it's not uh, exactly stronger than cyber witten variants. But since uh, they have good structure, one expects that if one use more complicated safety theory, one has a good hope of uh, getting something actually stronger. And for this talk, and the next one tomorrow morning, the goal is instead try to cure the second problem 
we'll be using non gauge theory. Uh, in four dimensions. And the goal is to get some 3D T5Ts that are actual T5Ts. So these are going to be well defined or expected to be well defined on all three manifolds. Um, well, it's uh, two plus one. It would be cool if uh, one can somehow leave this into 4D, as we don't have any very interesting full 4D T gravity. So we know that for gauge theory, um, you know how to start. You start with a gauge group and the method representation. So what can you do for non-gauge theory? As you might expect, non-gauge theory also share a lot of properties with gauge theories. So we'll be considering for the n equals two um, quantum field theories. And we have already learned from Professor Nakajima's lecture that we we'll have a Coulomb branch uh, for gauge theories. And this is true in general. For, for the angle through theory, whether it's gauge theory or not, you have um, Coulomb branches. And for a particular theory T, I would denote mt to be the Coulomb branch of the theory T on S1 times R3. For physics reasons, we expect that this is actually a hypercalar manifold, possibly with some singularities. And being hypercalar means that you will have a full S2 worth of complex structures. Compatible with the hypercalar metric. And uh, Hiraku has talked about how to define this uh, Coulomb branch away from two special complex structures. I would denote one complex structure by I, and the other will be minus I. And for this lecture and the next, we'll be actually focusing on this complex structure I. In complex structure I, MT is still going to be a complete integral system. And the base will be denoted by BT. This will be Coulomb branch of the theory, but instead on R4. And this is sometimes also referred to as the U-plane. And you have already heard a lot about it. The fibers now has a property that is always compact. And they are generically abelian varieties. And this is uh, in a sense why this particular complex structure is special. 
and when the fiber are, uh, there are particular points on this B where the fiber becomes singular. And then you can observe this phenomenon from the space by looking at its special Taylor metric. So the base B is instead equipped with a special Taylor metric. And this metric can also have singularities. And the singularity of uh, the special Taylor metric indicates that the fiber over some particular points also becomes singular. So let me give you some examples. So let's start with the theory that we are very familiar with. For physicists, this theory is uh, well known as U1 gauge theory. In Hiraku's talk, this means that you start from the data, G being C star and N being the zero representation. And then the Coulomb branch um, and T will, as was shown in Hiraku lecture, topologically be T2 times R squared. But we are going to put some complex structure on this, turning this to a complex manifold. It's easy to guess that this will be the second factor will become a copy of the complex plane. But how about the first one? It turns out that in order to, to specify the complex structure here, you need some additional data. So the U1 gauge theory is not just specified by the gauge group and matter representation. It's in fact labeled by an elliptic curve. And I will use sigma for this elliptic curve. And the first factor will be identified with Jacobian of this elliptic curve. So to draw a cartoon, you will have something like this. Here, the second factor C is also identified with the base or the U-plane. And the fibers are going to be uh, Jacobians of sigma. So this is uh, perhaps a simple example of the Coulomb branch. Any questions? So example number two, one can consider um, Again, a billion theory, but of higher rank, you went to the tree gauge theory. And then, if you apply the BFN construction, you obtain tree copies of this. So MT will be given by T2 times R squared to the tree's power. And what's the complex structure that you uh, should put here? It turns out that, again, you need some additional data. Uh, you went to the G gauge theory. It's going to be labeled by a genus G in my surface. I will, again, use sigma. This will be a genus G in my surface.
and the Coulomb branch as a complex manifold is identified again with Jacobian of sigma times c to the g. And the base b will be just c to the g. And you can interpret this as a space of holomorphic differentials on sigma. And the fibers are going to be just these uh, Jacobians. In these two examples, we see that this vibration, uh, in general, I will denote this vibration by pi. In these two cases, we see that the vibration is trivial. And this vibration being trivial, is basically synonymous with the theory being free. The word free is used by physicists to describe um, a class of theory that are somewhat boring. And the way to see this geometrically is to see that this vibration is going to be trivial. This does not sound terribly interesting, but we know that all vibrations are trivial locally. So if you look at a small enough patch, this will be the geometry that you are going to see. So this has uh, also a physics counterpart. So for physicists, they will say that in general, um, the theory T near um, non-singular points on the U-plane can be approximated by a free U1 to the G gauge theory. And we have already seen in Yan's talk that this fact has been used to um, amazing effect. And this theory would be referred to by physicists as the low energy effective theory. Or maybe L-E-E-T. In short, so geometrically, this just means that if you look at the U plane, you first see a lot of singularities of various co dimensions. And then, if you look at a small patch away from the singularity, you should be able to zoom in, and then you will recover the picture on the other side of the board. So this process of zooming in is also known by physicists as RG flows. But we know that um, sometimes there are singularities. What happens if you actually zoom in uh, around a singularity, then you will not get these free theories. 
you guys some interacting theories. So let me maybe give you some examples for interacting theories. Keep this picture for example one. So now, example three, these are examples for interacting theories. Interacting is the opposite of being free, and example three is what I would call the monopole theory. And you have already seen this multiple times in this program. This is, the theory is characterized by this data. First g equals to c star, and n equals to one copy of c, with uh, the obvious c star action. And for physicists, probably the theory is better referred to as as QED with one electron. And for this theory, the Coulomb branch would look like the following. Again, you have a one-dimensional base. So it looks like the complex plane, but the special kind of metric would have a singularity. <coughs> and if you're away from this singularity, you will have, again, an elliptic curve. But over this special point, you will have a curve with a double point. And this kind of singularity in elliptic vibration was classified by Kodaira. And this is what he would call an I1 singularity. So if you go around this singularity, you get an SL2Z monodromy. And that monodromy is going to be like this. Example number four. This example is again familiar. This is SU2 gauge theory. So the data is given by G equals to SL2C and again equals zero. And for this theory, if you are being very naive, you would guess that the Coulomb branch looks like the following, pretty much like the picture over there, but with only an I4 singularity. But it turns out that this is not entirely correct. Cyber and Witten pointed out that there are quantum effects that correct this picture to the following. Now instead of having a single I4 singularity, you have two I1 singularity. And the fibers will look like roughly like this. 
and this. Away from this, uh, these two similarities, you have again an elliptic curve. So now the base um, B just look like the U-plane that you have encountered many times. So two singularities and um, at infinity, there's, uh, you can view infinity also another singularity. And the monogamy around these two singularities are going to be given by one zero minus one zero and minus one, four, minus one, three. And, oh, sorry, this is one. And you can check that these are actually elements in SL2Z. And if you multiply them, you will get a monogamy that is compatible with I4 singularity. So one of these um, singularity is usually referred to again as monopole singularity. Monopole. Well, the other is sometimes referred to as dion singularity, just to distinguish that from the monopole singularity. But locally, the picture will just look like this. I have to change our basis for the elliptic curve. Exactly. If you multiply them, you will see that you get something that is conjugate to 1, 4, 0, 1. And that's a monogamy at infinity. So at infinity, there is a, here at infinity, you again have an I4. And you can see that by multiplying them. Any more questions? And uh, both theories on the blackboards give you interesting uh, four manifold invariants. And for this, as you all know, that this leads to the cyber width invariants. And here, this geometry is sometimes referred to as cyber width geometry. But if you study invariants from this theory, you will get Donaldson invariants. And the fact that there are two copies of monopole theory on the U-plane is basically the physical reason why you would have the Witten conjecture, which states that there's a way to decompose Donaldson invariants into some of two copies of several Witten invariants. And to be more precise, there is, of course, another contribution from the U-plane, which is exactly the focus of Jan's talk. So for this geometry on, on the board, it seems that we start from the simplest one, free theory, free theory of higher rank, to this theory that looks slightly more interesting, and to this one, which looks, uh, seems to be the most interesting, um, most interesting theory on the board. But actually, for the first three examples, this theory enjoy a special property that the first theory does not have. So let me let me erase this board and remark that for the first 
three different cases, the Coulomb branch and T admit a nice S1 action. This S1 action here will just be rotation of the complex plane uh, B. And in the fourth example, there's no way to cook up a similar S1 action. At least if you want to find the S1 action on B that acts as isometry, there's, uh, there's nothing that you can do. So in the fourth example, there's no S1 action. And when physicists see something like this, they will say that these theories are, well, at least they look like conformal theories. And this theory looks like non-conformal theories. And here we see that this S1 is actually there in this naive picture. But due to quantum effects, it's somehow destroyed. This is sometimes known as quantum anomaly. And Faisi would say that um, this S1 is anonymous in SU2 gauge theory. So what's special about conformal theories? What kind of property do we expect for conformal theories? So since we are talking about theory with supersymmetry, combining supersymmetry and conformal, we'll get superconformal theories. And we expect the following properties that the Coulomb branch enjoys. We expect that there is an S1 isometry acting on um, the Coulomb branch MT and this S1 also acts on, on the base B in such a way that pi is actually S1 equivalent. So this is exactly this uh, U1 uh, R symmetry that, um, that was mentioned in Yan's talk. So remember that in the beginning, he talked about SU2L, SU2R times SU2 times U1. And S1 is related to this U1. It's not exactly equal, but it maps into this. So it maps onto this U1. So I will say more about this uh, later. So um, this is the expected property. And we also expect that if you look at S1 fixed points, um, the U plane, this has to be a point. And this special point is sometimes referred to as the superconformal point. And the superconformal point gave the um, U-plane structure, the structure of a vector space. So sometimes I will use um, zero to denote this superconformal point. It seems that there are a lot of requirements. And so far, the theory that are superconformal looks a little bit boring. And you may want to ask whether they are interesting. 
superconformal theories. There are, and there are many of them. Yes? Um, at the level, well, TQFTs are automatically superconformal, but probably you are asking whether if you, yeah, at the level of four manifold invariants. So, yeah, there, there was this uh, very long paper by um, Greg Moore, Mourinho, and uh, uh, Pradza, am I pronouncing the name correctly, where they um, discuss uh, whether you can do some interesting with superconformal theories. And the invariants they get are indeed enjoy some special properties. So this motivates them to state, um, to formulate this uh, superconformal simple type condition. So there are some interesting uh, features for this invariant coming from superconformal theories. Any more questions? So um, the example for superconformal theory, so now example maybe five. This is a big class of theories known as class I theories that has appeared in many previous talks. So for a theory of type class S, it will be labeled by um, the algebra of type ABE. And you can also, also allow abelian U1 factors. And then uh, Riemann surface. And for them, the Coulomb branch, as was also mentioned, will be identified with the moduli space of G Higgs model. surface sigma. So as Hiroko mentioned, if you um, apply um, like a BFN construction or if, if you expect somehow you can apply BFN con construction, you are going to get the same space but with a slightly different complex structure where this space will be viewed as the moduli space uh, will be viewed as the GC, G character variety on sigma. And for the complex structure that we are working in, we're actually getting the model space of uh, G Higgs models. And then it's well known that for G Higgs models, indeed there is uh, a map, um, it's a total space of a complete integrable system, and the vibration is sometimes referred to as a kitchen vibration. And indeed you have an S1 action that has all these properties. And this S1 action is sometimes referred to as the kitchen action or kitchen's S1 action. So this is a very big uh, class of theories. And in fact, the theory, uh, the example one, two, can be viewed as special cases of this theory. So if you take actually G to be U1, well, I mean, uh, OK. I think I'm not terribly consistent. Probably I should uh, use C. And then. Um, again, use this sigma, then you can reproduce example one, two. 
an interesting fact about class F theory is that sometimes they are gauge theories, but sometimes they are not gauge theories. So to give an example of a non-gauge theory, but of type class S, example six, um, you will consider G to be S of three and sigma being P1, but now you allow um, this to have marked points and you will have three marked points decorated by some ramification data. And the Coulomb branch will look like the following. Now, the base is still one dimensional, so it will still look like uh, the complex plane. And because this is superconformal, there is a unique singularity on the base. And now over that, you will have a single fiber that looks like this. In Kodaira's classification, this is known as a four star or IV star singularity. Um, to some physicists, this is referred to as the E8 singularity. Oh, sorry, E6. E8 would correspond to two star. When you, when you say singularity, what precisely do you, what precisely it's, uh, The total space is smooth. It's a singularity in the elliptic el fibration. The fibers is uh, singular. Uh, the fiber break is not the usual one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The fibers are. Um, and also, um, if you look at the spectral kernel metric, you have uh, really a singularity in this metric. So remember the picture that Jan has drawn for us? You should really stretch this uh, singularity to infinity to form some cat. When, when do you say that theory is a gauge theory? Hmm? What's the definition of a gauge theory? Well, for gauge theory, uh, for physics, one has a list of expectations. And in this example, one can check that one expectation is actually not satisfied. So maybe let me just say this. We know that for gate theory, there are particular type of deformations known as exactly marginal deformations. And for this kind of theory, we're not observing that. So we know that uh, it's not a gate theory. There are also other arguments, but slightly more complicated. No, um, they, are, they are not Lagrangian. And therefore, they cannot be gate theory because gate theories are all Lagrangian. Other questions? Uh, if I move on to the singularity, the effective theory is known as uh, Miller Hanam Chansky's E6 theory. So, Miller Hanam Chansky's, uh, sometimes just denoted as MN E6. And as you expect, there's also MN E7 and E8. These are all expected to be non-gauge theories. Yeah, if you move away from this, you get free theory. That's right. No, if you zoom in at the singularity. Yes. So you can imagine that there's some bigger theory that has this type of singularity. If you are away from this, you get free theory. But if you really zoom in at this singularity, you get this theory. This theory is a conformal theory. So, and then um, the goal that we have is to define some uh, invariance of uh, the four three manifolds. But this kind of modern spaces look uh, somewhat problematic because there are non-compact directions. 
But if you has paid attention to all the previous talks, you would say that this is not a big problem as long as we have some symmetry so that we can do some equivalent localization. So now, for a thermal conformal theory, we know that there is S1 action. And now you can ask whether this S1 help. So if you look at some particular partition function, can somehow you use this S1 to do some equivalent integral and get some finite answer? Well, it can help a little bit, actually. Let me tell you in what kind of cases it actually helps. So if you have the theory T, and this theory is in four dimensions, and you can consider uh, the Hilbert space of T. Of T, and here I actually mean the topologically twisted theory. S3. So by physics argument, the Hilbert space of this topological twisted theory on S3 can be identified with the space of regular functions on the U-plane. And for U plane that looks like this, obviously the space of regular functions is going to be infinite dimensional. So if you want to compute partition function, of the theory T on S1 times S3, this partition function is identified with the dimension of the Hilbert space. And then clearly this is infinite, it's EO defined. So, and this um, indicates that there is some problem. And then you, you can notice that, oh, there's the S1 action. So you can actually, instead of looking at partition function of T, you can look at S1 equivariant. partition function of t. In other words, instead of computing the dimension, um, you now compute the holomorphic Euler characteristic um, S1 equivariant of the structure shift of B. And then, because by assumption, the fixed points of this S1, uh, there's a unique fixed point. This will be well defined and given by a very simple formula. So to be completely uh, elementary and pedagogical, let's just take um, the example of the free theory. And then, the U plane is identified with the complex plane. And the space of functions, uh, I will write H T S3 to denote the, um, the Hilbert space of the theory T on S3. This is now identified with um, well, it's spanned by polynomials in one variable. Let me use z for that variable. And obviously, this is infinite dimensional. But then, if you use this S1 action, 
that tell you that you should count this contribution from all these spaces in a slightly different way. So instead, you would get, instead of 1 plus 1 plus 1, you get 1 plus t plus t squared plus t cubed plus dot dot dot. And then if you sum them up, you get 1 over 1 minus t. This is the, you can, of course, directly reproduce this uh, by using the most basic um, equivalent localization technique. So you see that in this case, it helped a little bit. So at least for S3, before we're having infinity, now we're having one, we're having some rational function in T. And this is well defined as long as T is not one. And then you can ask this question. Can we regularize S1 times M3 partition function. Oops. So given uh, three manifolds, you have again some Hilbert space. And then you perhaps would hope that somehow you can still use this S1 action to regularize this and maybe get now a C star family of 3D T gravities. Somehow topological with respect to uh, M3. And it's a C star family because only for T equals one is not well defined. So you may hope that uh, with, re with respect to log T, you will have a complete C-star family. But this is too unrealistic. So impossible. And a quick way to see that this is a complete pipe dream is to notice that there is a no-go theorem. So um, a well-known result in, um, in the theory of fusion category tell you that this is known as Ocnenu rigidity which basically imply that you, that you cannot you can never, so there won't exist uh, one parameter deformation. Of 3D T gravities. Um, in other words, 3D T gravities are rigid. It's not possible to just deform that by some t parameter. So somehow this must fail. And indeed, from physics, you also see that this is not realistic because S1 is an R symmetry. And by definition, an R symmetry means that this X on supercharges and that can cause problem because in the definition of T graph T somehow you want to get some scalar supercharge and you want to look at this uh, Q cohomology and if this S1 acts not trivially somehow there will be problem associated with this T graph T. 
and this is roughly the physical reason to see, um, the physical way to see that you cannot do this. So what can you do? So you don't want R symmetry. Instead, you want uh, flavor symmetry. And flavor symmetry means that you will not act on supercharges. So you will have a well-defined action on this kind of Hilbert space. And, but then there's still some tension between this rigidity result And from this, one expects that we should use, actually, a discrete flavor symmetry that acts on supercharges. Otherwise, if you compute, again, some equivariant index, you are, again, getting Caesar family. And you know that, that that's impossible. So, to have some well-defined 3D TQFTs is, is only possible if uh, you manage to use some discrete flavor symmetries. But how to find discrete flavor symmetries? For different theory, they tend to have different kind of flavor symmetries. It turns out that for a large class of theories, there are some canonical ones. Mm -hmm. uh, why does it work for the uh, Sorry, S2? S3? S3. S3. So S1 times S3, yes. Yeah. It, it will work for S1 times S3. Oh, you're asking why it works for S1 times S3? Yeah, it's actually a, a long story. So somehow, if you compatify on S3 or any cipher manifolds, in the end, for this quantum mechanics, there is going to be a, some flavor symmetry. It's closely related to this U1. And because there is it's a flavor symmetry, somehow you can use it. So it's, um, so this only work for S1 times roughly cipher manifolds. And cipher manifolds, although they still have general Holonomy, there's a, some special limit where the holonomy can become U1 if you pick some singular metric. That's kind of why you can have uh, additional flavor symmetry that can help. But in general, you won't expect this. So um, let me just end with one remark um, about how to find such uh, discrete flavor symmetry. It turns out that very often, you have a Zn subgroup inside your S1. And n here is a positive integer. And therefore, it can be either 1 or larger than 1. If n equals 1, then this group is trivial. You, don't, you cannot do anything. If n is larger than 1, then you can do something. And the, this n only depends on the theory. You mean that there is n such that there is that flavor symmetry? Because you always have the n in this one. Yeah, there is a largest possible n such that uh, the, you have a flavor Zn symmetry. Largest. And for there are theories such that the largest is just a trivial thing. And these are include all previous examples. And all gauge theories.
And for n larger than 1, this theory has to be non-gauge theories. So there is something that non-gauge theory can do, but gauge theory can never do. And tomorrow we will see that for a nice class of non-gauge theories where, uh, that belong to the second class, actually you can or is expected to get a family of 3D TQFT, but now it won't be a C star family. So tomorrow we will try to get a not a C star family, but a ZN star family of 3D TQFTs. Now there's no contradiction or no goal theorem preventing us from uh, getting this ZN star family. So I will end here and see you tomorrow. <laughs>